Okay, everybody, you're all very welcome to this Centre for Sustainability Quality and Climate Action talk. And today we're delighted to have uh, Professor Pat Reardon from Dublin City uh, University. Um, Pat is currently a professor in the School of Communications. Yeah. Um, um, he's also a co-director, I believe, of the new uh, Climate and Society Research uh, Centre. Um, Pat's interest, as you can see from his presentation, is in green politics, ecology, uh, creative writing, and in particular, visual representations of ecological and green themes. And he's just had a book published this year in, in 2022, which, if you get this right, um, it's called Essential Concepts of Environmental Communication, an A to Z Guide. And Pat's going to talk to us today about the audio visual media industry and the climate crisis. So I'm actually to give Maud a warm Wednesday that Pat's way. So you're very welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Down to DCU a couple of weeks ago and give a rowdy performance, and I certainly can't replicate that. But I'm sort of I'm trying to give you a sense of where I'm coming from with regards to, to media and sort of how the media can do in some way help in this time of time emergency. So the way I'm sort of structuring this talk is sort of mainly talking at the start about mediating climate change and how the media, I'm sort of a film scholar that's interested in environmental communication. I'm using a breath defense, and I'm interested in all aspects of audiovisual media. So when we talk about the mind print of media and how it sort of can promote an environmental agenda. And that's sort of a big part of my talk. And then I'm moving into about the media industry. As, we, as John and I were saying earlier, the media industry is as culpable as the education sector in not addressing climate change as it should be. So the media industry needs to get its act together with regards to its carbon footprint. So just in the last three or four years, uh, I've been involved in setting up uh, an organization called Screen Green. It's a linkage of all the Southern Irish, or can say the pub, but on, the, on my side of the border, uh, RT, TG Carr, Virgin, as well as the funding agencies. And we have both, uh, we lease out the carbon calculator that's done from the BBC, Albert calculator. So you guys are familiar with that. This side. So all BBC, all ITV use this. So we sort of, I'll give you a sense of that, the history of that, and what we've tried to do in, in developing that sort of, sort of um, project, which is still ongoing and has its own challenges. So I, I'll stand up because I prefer to walk around to see me okay. Yeah. So the media needs to set up for the challenge. I mean, we, we keep arguing that, but the media can't sort of just be fell out babbler and say it's environmental. Really, it needs to show it's an And, you know, the danger of the media just preaching without having some credibility is always there. It's like all industries, and John and I were saying earlier, banks and everyone's trying to get in this bandwagon of greening, media, greening their environment, their sort of industry, but the media certainly needs to be involved. So it, when I was writing this, that book, that A to Z student guide, they, I was sort of, we were all exercised by COVID, because that's when I was writing it. And we've all tried to sort of imagine, could we use, could, could we learn from COVID and how we would deal with it? So most environmental scholars are trying to see the connections. And we've all hoped that there would be a, a better response post-COVID, which unfortunately hasn't really happened, but can we learn some lessons? So, you know, the, the, the argument that's often used is the virus it's easy to fight somebody against a virus, whereas we're the enemy with climate change. And that's that, that's really a challenge. It's hard to get people to accept that and see, see the differences. Uh, so I, I still think, and John talks a lot about this as well in his writings, the power of storytelling is, is absolutely what we are. We're storytelling beings. So the media, and that includes literature, all the arts, can tell the story of climate change and climate crisis, and whatever name you want to put it on, and trying to make, tell it in different ways, and in more challenging ways, to engage audiences. So, so as a media person, this is what I'm endlessly trying to look at. Since my PhD back a long time ago, I looked at Hollywood cinema. So I've always been looking at how media represent uh, the environment. So I'm going to 
So what this is taking, looking down from the Pompidou Center in Paris. And I'm sort of always exercised by that challenge of what can art do? Or what can, how do we reflect and speak to audiences? So how do we sort of, I'm interested in, always interested in textual analysis, looking at how the media construct narrative around environmental issues. But also I'm very interested in how audiences receive those texts. So in my research in, in this view, and as, as John was saying, as part of this research center, I'm involved in climate and society with our masters and our PhDs. I've done lots of work with PhD students and others looking at audience reception studies, as well as environmental textual analysis. So how to typify, classify audiences and how to understand where they're coming from and how they're engaging with these narratives is really challenging for me and quite keeps me on my toes. So the power of media to help tackle climate change, I mean, we can say it doesn't help that much because we keep arguing about climate change that there's the media is still under, very much underrepresenting the climate issues. There's less than 5% of, of all media output is explicitly about climate change, about the crisis. Uh, so how do we normalize it and promote it in a more effective way? Uh, and yet we talk about this brain print. Uh, you know, the whole history of media studies, which I come from, is looking at how the media normalize an ideological status quo, how they normalize debates around race, class, gender issues, how they sort of promote different sort of things. I think have been very central in promoting various forms of citizenship across the world in some cases. So they have, a, they have an enormous power, but how is it leveraged, how effective is it, and how successful is this, this challenge? So these transformations is partially driven by push factors such as Pressures from regulators. I'll be talking a bit later that now in Ireland, where uh, funding agencies are insisting that all media productions have to use the carbon calculator. So there's a slight push to try and regulate, to make, to try and address these problems and make the media more sort of engaged. And that's a very important challenge for, for media scholars and for media producers to try and make stuff that's much more sustainable as. as uh, employees, I mean, we get this from a lot of our students in our master's program are coming from industries, they're quite mature, and they're insisting now that their industries and their, their companies are taking these issues on board. Uh, we know of from big corporations that they can't get staff now if young graduates don't realize that they're not they're not doing the right thing. The CEO doesn't sort of isn't speaking truth to power around climate. So that's a big, that's surprisingly a, an interesting push factor that, that's happening. Um, and stakeholders, I mean, are stakeholders always just looking for the bottom line? Of course they are. Um, with regards to financial companies, uh, John has written a lot about this. I, I, I know that instinctively. Uh, but yet we're all complicit in the sense that a lot of pension funds, why aren't they more engaged in greening their, their sort of funding agencies? And that's, I had a big, uh, made a talk a couple of weeks ago with BlackRock, which is one of the biggest financial institutions in the world, and they have a branch in Dublin. And they're open to that. Uh, but how open is, is the question? And they, but yet, as we've seen with COP, we just need lots and lots of money to try and change things around. So the, the industry needs to get their act together. Media content must use all forms of creativity to reach and promote values and behavior that help create a positive community. So that's obviously what we, we want to do. And when we talk to media organizations, they all say they're doing that, but they're not. Because they'll have a media program, but they'll have ads in between to promote flying and air travel and all the sort of things that are counterintuitive when you look at the program that they make. So, and they'll say it's an editorial rationale, they need the advertising. So they'll justify it in lots of ways. But how to how to engage in these issues and not be just fellow traveling and just being virtue signaling is an endless tension and something we always need as scholars call out 
and try to see how to engage with those tensions. So they must develop, again, it's most rather than art, uh, an international an intentional editorial policy, which takes account of the type of content and what the audience is, and how we can sort of engage with these audiences. So the media are becoming, and so senior management are now, so we say, taking it more seriously, but that's what we need. And this is what we want to try and get away from. We need new imagine. We need new ways of telling these stories. This, this narrative is no longer resonant with audiences because it's so cliched, so stereotypical. It's still potent, it's still quite powerful as a means of engaging audiences, but it's just too uh, assay now. So when we are talking to our undergraduate or our postgraduate students that are in media, media production, we want them to try and come up with new ways of telling new ways of exciting audiences, whether it's on TikTok, whether it's on whatever medium they're interested in, we need to tell the story. And that's the ongoing challenge that I think the media industry is need to be very aware of and, and try to connect with. And I think if we at least do something around that, it will at least make the debate more effective in, in connecting with certain This is a report that was commissioned by Deloitte and the Albert Calculator in the UK. And this is their quite, I think, pithy summary of what the media and the modes of how audiovisual media can affect society. I mean, they're, again, we love generalizations from as films and media scholars, but they're, they're quite effective. So it needs to be a questioning modality played into all media. It can't be just uh, preaching or just giving messages. There has to be a dialogue, a simple question, revealing hidden, hidden aspects of what's there. So documentary needs to do that. Uh, helping audiences understand how their own actions might be having an impact. So that's where questioning needs to be resonant within lots of media content. In the same way, we would argue that, and um, this report would argue, there needs to be a deliberate strategy of actively engaging with yourself, not just leaving it passively and responding to news as lots of programs do, but we need to go out there and do deliberate strategies. Uh, RT has done weeks on climate change, and that could be seen as a gimmick. Well, probably other media do that as well, but deliberate campaigns at least put it on the agenda and make it sort of more resonant, uh, sort of how to do we certainly need inspiring shows. We need something to actually get their buttons and do something, think something, engage, not just sort of see everyone in their bubble. And environmentalists, I'm teaching a lot of environmental students, of course they're all a message, but they're not the people I'm interested in in media terms. I want to talk to the people who are no interest in the environment or for some reason are not connected, because they're the ones that need to be mobilized. They're, they're also, in case we don't, think our citizens, they're also, you know, they need to be activated in that way. So how to inspire audiences? And of course, we have problems, we all have problems with net zero as a concept, and uh, I'm just trying to reach that. This is a bit controversial. Should we silence deniers? Should we, uh, in some way, because that's been a big issue, we've had real problems where we've had on programs, on news programs, few years ago, where the Niers would have equal chance of response, of voice and response in, in a program, giving them a legitimacy that it's a, that there's an open debate. And yet, as we all know, 99% of scientists all agree that this is a man-made problem. So what's, why, nothing to see here, folks. Why, why are we still putting the Niers into programs? Because media like content we've seen in that debate. But they want, they want everyone agreeing. That doesn't make good media. So media is about conflict. It's about trying to cease. So how do we deal with that? Or do we sort of have a censorship debate? Do we have? So that's a bit somewhat resolved now. And most media will not have, I think, deniers. It's not. Uh, it's 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 the platform is one. I think maybe not. Uh, what was it? Amplifying. Again, that's a real debate we have all the time. You know, it, it needs to be normalised, as I say, climate crisis, but it also needs to be amplified. 
And some people in the current world that we live in, where there's so many crises, people screaming all over the place, that you can have problems. How do you how do you make something heard in in a current world where there are so many crises, so many difficulties, the war, the famines, and really, and yet they're all interconnected, related. How to sort of really amplify it. The normalizing, again, this report loves the repair shop. This is a very twee middle class agenda. And, and I would, I really like challenging students that the climate crisis debates tend to be very middle class. It's all protecting white, whites wanting to protect what they have, and that's very conservationist rather than being radical in time of justice. So the real tension there in how to sort of how the media addresses this is quite important as well because we talk about you know we need to marry the climate crisis race class and gender issues. There's no question about that. But how do you do that successfully is, is quite challenging for a lot of students and a lot of, a lot of academics. So in my research I would sort of very, that's very basic stuff, but we do a lot of media literacy. And also, I really see the need for media students to see the connection between media literacy and environmental literacy, and how the two can interconnect. So one of my books had a, a piece on that, looking at sort of the, the gender. And digital audiences, and is new media very different in its effect than old media, than so-called legacy media? The online media. So we, we media centers, we talk a lot about the, the active agency of online media and how effective that is, because it seems more progressive than legacy media, which we would have debates around again, whether so we can feel anything about that tension. In my teaching and in all environmental communication teaching, we tend to talk a lot about food, because everyone is connected. Food really exercises so much debates, so food documentaries, food films, and food engagement, and the green anxieties around food and food security. And I've written a lot about farming, which I'll talk about later. So I'm very interested in how the representations of food production feed into those debates. And again, everyone needs to be engaged in this. Food, somewhere. Um, the growing power of eco documentaries. So, uh, again, I've written about the whole history of documentaries, environmental documentaries. How they become more important and more powerful? Are they still just um, fairly bland? Do they speak to different ways than other forms of documentaries? Is there a, is there a niche eco documentary, environmental documentary that's, that's, that can become more effective? And that's something I'm interested in. But what is the power of Documentary, visibly fictional narratives. Um, but I'm also absolutely blown away by. I can spend weeks watching television, so I can justify my sort of online media by analysing cult classics like Sopranos and Homer to try and see how we can decode an, an environmental subtext in these mega series that have very high production values have huge audiences. And the argument that we have in environmental communication is that it's often not the explicit environmental text that's most effective, it's the implicit environmentalism. So environmentalism is in the subtext mm. and audiences connect with that and we can engage in very different ways. So I write a lot about that. How, it's, how we sort of engage with text in different ways, whether they're mainstream or it's in the subtext. Other cult classics, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. If you haven't seen Better Call Saul, it's, it's beyond good. Uh, it's so rich in its characterization. But again, I've really done a very close reading of the two brothers in Better Call Saul, which I think speak to an agenda of climate change. One brother, I won't give it away, he's a very anal type character who really is very legalistic and wants systemic change. And he's very autistic, almost in his engagement. Whereas Saw is a total charlatan and just wants to play by the book, doesn't want to play by the book at all. And it's the combining of those two modalities 
the climate issues can be addressed. We need both types. So that's that's sort of where my series works. Because we have the back down with the students, and I've always I don't play video games, but I've written a lot about it. So I hope video games can be effective in how they sort of engage with it's like new generation audiences, how they become more effective in their agency, how they sort of speak to the sort of dialogue of different generations. And, and there are a lot of really good green analysis of video games. So the usual debate is about serious games versus sort of pleasure games. And I would say bold can be equally sort of, and there's a huge debate around that. I, I just did a small thing on Pokemon Go. My parents, so there's a huge debate about online media. The kids are getting obese because they're all online all the time. They're not going out into nature. So we keep arguing we, we need to valorize nature. We need to develop its uh, biophilic nature. So we want biophilia is the love of nature. So how do we get kids to love nature? And we can do it through fictional narratives, which is counterintuitive. So we want to look out to nature, but well, could we argue po Pokemon Go where they have to go out physically to collect the Pokemon? Is that at least making them come? So it's a bit risible, but it's trying to sort of see how all forms of media can be in some way effective in trying to tip the dial for different generations and different audiences. And that's what we're doing. With a PhD student of mine from Uruguay, and we got this PhD student, which I know knew nothing about Uruguay, Victoria Gomez is her name. And I found out that Uruguay and Ireland are very similar. We're both farming, we both have a rural urban economy, we both have a So she was doing her PhD was on environmental literacy in young people across the two divide, across the divide, across those two. So she's finished and published. And we did a paper then where we, we did some audience research. My son, uh, my younger son, loved this guy, Prince Ian. He's a rapper, black rapper. And he does stuff on environmental issues. And it's worth looking up. It's a bit, it's like younger kids or whatever, but it's very rich in its evocation of speaking the message of climate change. So, uh, water and media. so we would show this video to higher education students, second third year students, do focus groups and did an audience analysis of how effective such texts were in engaging with climate change. So we, we published a paper on that. So again, I don't think it's limited to documentaries, it's fictional films. It can cross the whole divide of other types of media in how media can be effective or not. Some of you may have seen Holland. If you haven't, you should. It's stunning. Uh, again, there's a huge debate around carry and how the pathologizing of a an illness and the dangers of gender and how it's represented. So there's been a lot of issues about how she's been represented. And usually either love her or hate her, but she drives this narrative. But Holland is also about obviously fake. It does a lot of this conspiracy post 9 11 sort of stuff. So there's a scene in one episode where it, we really are all about creating fake news to sort of be an alternative universe, which has played into a lot of debates around fake news of late. But the big one that that connects with is obviously climate gate on a whole issue we've had where academics, good academics, are usually doing things for the right reasons, but they get hammered by media, by miscommunication and by communication issues. So how to sort of engage with that, how academics need to step up to the mark in regards to climate issues and engage with their universities and engage with the media and be pop. So how to manage that is difficult, it's challenging, um, but it's something that um, media environmental science needs to be good at. Um, so how do we create uh, difficult stories? Uh, narratives are much more than mere truths that are used to inform and entertain. So, when edutainment is the mutual argument, we say, well, I would argue even in edutainment, there can be a, a subtext there. So, 
Yeah, and it gets a bit heavy. So again, if you want to read some of this, you can read it's not for digestion on screen. Others, another big area that I teach a lot about is animal rights and access. Students really connect to this. And obviously we all know that they are very getting, they are in the vanguard of activism in an extreme form, as they do resonate with justice and injustice. Again, we all know flying is bad for us. This was a post 9-11 movie that actually happened. You know the story, the plane going over New York just had taken off and was hit by birds and it had almost collapsed, but they would survive. So it's a great hero worship story. Birds, now, they know that birds too. They're called, it's called bird slurry when birds get captured in, in the plane. And there's huge debates around how to make sure it never happens and whatever. But if, if we were to do an ecological balance sheet of who has the right to be up there flying naturally, <laughs> I, I think we would have to accept that the birds have an absolute resonance over the, the planes. And yet the storyline is always about, we're very anthropomorphized, we always see everything from a human perspective. And how to develop that and question that is something we need to do a lot of because it helps us to rethink and re-pivot our thinking into ways that need to we need to engage. So, so a cautionary tale. So I, I, I write a lot about cautionary tales and how these narratives create cautionary things. Um, read the narrative against the grain. So is it against the grain uh, in environmental and in in English literature, we talk about reading against the grain, not what the dominant reading is, trying to see the subtext about it. So we do that a lot in, in film studies and in media studies, but concerning society's excessive preoccupation, easy and available air travel. So the running air mentality of, you know, no one wants to pay an extra few bob for climate uh, on the flight ticket, which is an obvious thing there should be. There should be taxes, big taxes on air travel. But it's not seen as normative, acceptable, but yet it should be a key agenda for all environmentalists. No brainer, I think. Uh, so, how do we get that? So, in the post 9 11 world, there was a need for heroes. We, we talk about this need for heroes, and, 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 and yet, how do we uh, deal with these holes? Uh, so, we're looking at a real good time story and, and whatever, but at what cost and how do we? Do? Um, back home, I constantly write about Cornell. That's all I want. You know, Sunny John area folks love the community and government about the last day. Greenery and the landscape and the monument is just magnificent. We have a fantastic island. So I talk about greening Ireland, greening, and that's not a touristic, that's greening from an environment. So whether it's extractivism. So I've written a lot about Man of Aaron, the classic 1930s, where devs literally are, I don't know, dev, I hope, whether they are the president of Ireland and teacher for a long, long time. He literally weeped at the film because it was so connected to his vision of Irishness. And this is a very important documentary that I'm sure it's not write about all the time, but like, in ways, that's, a, that's sort of an agenda that we need to go back to, to take away the politics. Uh, so the attention. Atlantic is, uh, there's a chap who's made the pike has also gone Atlantic, and that's about fishing and oil exploration. I mean, we all know, I like, presume, that in the Republic, within the EU, Ireland basically sold out fishing for chap. It was all about just legitimating farming. So that was the big agenda. So farming has always been on this very high trajectory. So fishing has been marginalized in this way. And this tension between stewardship and despoiling is something that exercises me all the time. It's a proper song. I'm constantly looking at representations of farming, whether it's in the news, whether it's in politics, whether it's in films. So I'm sure you've all seen The Field, which is a, an oral text of Irish film studies. 
他的经历啊，比喻啊，那 ，it's sort of a post-colonial discourse about the land is more important than anything else, and that continues up to the present day, where farmers won't let people onto land. Land is so precious; it's reified to an almost extinction. And that sort of is understandable, but it's worrying as a farmer. The more recent film, Pilgrim Hill, is a really great film. It really shows the reality of trying to eke out an existence in a modern farming environment. And it's quite uh, difficult. It's a, it's a not easy feeling. But these tensions between stewardship and the spoiling continues into the sort of the current day, where really farmers get accused and are being victimized by the environmental movement. They're at the behest of these usually urban environmentalists telling them what to do. So we have Antashik and Santa. How dare Antashik come down to tell us? So these tensions re reify an urban rural divide and continues. I come from the Midlands in Ireland, so I'm very connected to the bog. This bog of Allen, the big bog in the middle of Ireland, was really exploited when we became, uh, when, when the country was nationalised to create peat, to build our energy. So it became the ultimate extractive industry. And it was very much accepted and normalised. And now, God help us, Ford Namalma is trying to be green. So it's, it's so hypocritical, so problematic. And as my colleague keeps saying, the way they, they, they do that is put a green fodder on the corn. So that's theirs. But they haven't moved on. They're not allowed to extract pea now. So they're putting wind farms to build lots of stuff. But there's this tension about how bog extraction, and we now know about importance. Uh, the natural sink of the bomb and the bomb is very important from a time perspective. So how do we deal with that? How do we represent it? So you picked up the very early film. Uh, some of you might have seen one of the first big Irish films. But it's uh, the bomb is just in the background. It's not really, but it's still there and it's still playing with pipe. Pipe is about Shelf Sea, which is a really big debate in the current color gas field. It looks like it might be a lot of field is submitted and thinking of exploiting as a trans as a transitionary field. So this was a really good documentary about activism made over four or five years, showing the locals and how they engage with this tension with the big sort of uh, multinational development. So it's, uh, and there was synergies and links to Nigeria at the time. So there was a lot of that post-colonial connections going on to make these these things so tensions. Uh, more recently we we talk a lot about nimbyism, not in my backyard. So we all want wind farms, but the lands are not near me. So, so in, there's a real problem we have that obviously the wind farms and solar and solar power are seen as the, the panacea really because they're not the extractive, they're using a lot of resources. But we see them as very important, and they are. But we've had a huge problem in Ireland about people objecting. So, how do we mobilize people? The research on environmental communication, we have a huge tension between sort of moving from feeling of, of engaging with uh, green issues and having attitudinal change and pushing that to behavioural change. It's a huge difference. All the research shows that behavioural change is much more challenging. Everyone buys into the green agenda, but that it means I have to do something different. Maybe that's human nature, but it's a, it's a big challenge for us as environmentalists and for our communities. We're talking about fracking earlier and nuclear energy. Again, these are huge debates in and in Ireland, um, but Ireland has been very, the public has been very anti-nuclear since Karen Soar, and now we have a real resurgence of some people wanting nuclear, so it's coming back on the agenda again. Fracking is banned outside snow, it's all banned, so again, will that come back 
sort of stay long for labs. Okay, so field on this, you know, really sort of celebrating, almost becomes identified with the landscape. The farmer is at one in the landscape. So that's the ultimate romantic idol when the character the protagonist becomes part. The primeval struggle over land becomes a central focus of identification. And there's a great opening speech where Paul McKay pontificates to his son about God made the world. It's quite an environmentalist, it's a, it's a green agenda. So, in other words, he's constructing and making this field true natural, and he's using his own hands to sort of protect, protect his land, and that's what's on the well, we have this colonial history with positions as um, John Kevin, who Gibbons, um, certain in the US. We have the territory of London, we have the state environment, it's in that the end, but a certain myth of romanticism. This myth of romanticism has pervaded most Irish rural films for a long, long time. It's still does. Don't actually see the banshees yet, mm. but why? I'm in my fault. So how romanticism still pervades that sort of notion. Um, so farming certainly continues to be at the real cutting edge of the bait. And we have a bigger problem because we have, what is it, John, 33% or 34% of our emissions to maintain. Uh, it's, it's through cattle and through cows. We have huge problems with our monocultural system where Nitrogen runoff into lakes and rivers is still going up. It's got worse pollution in, in rivers is really, really bad, and yet it's not being addressed. I was watching a documentary recently for a, a Deer to the Ground, which is a magazine program. And this farmer in the south was, he had seven years ago 50 calves, he now has 360. And he said, Over his dead body, will anyone be taken? You will not allow any so how do we sort of engage with that sort of debate? You know, so it, it's getting quite challenging to say the least, and yet it's, it's a real challenge. So you can meet what I mentioned before. Again, this bogland, the, the media bogland in literature has this sort of ethereal quality and it's 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 very gothic. People mm -hmm. got lost in bogs and people were buried in bogs, and we, we all know the tall man. So the problem has a, has a residue in, in literature and culture. So exploitation was part of a nationalist project. When the immigration was very much legitimized, no question about it. Uh, and the film has this subtext of global exploitation where a big multinational comes down and the locals lose their jobs. So the problem becomes just part of that. Um, so they end up with unmarked. So the move, as I say, the branding of Ornamon is still about greening. It's sort of, as is most copies. But how do we, I mean, I might take issue with some of you on greenwashing. I, I see greenwashing as a continuum, either on or off. It's more, uh, everyone is playing greenwashing, even the green part. So how do we sort of uh, rationalize? So it's, it's not just, it's, it's almost a verb rather than a noun. So it's it's like it's it's, it's different agencies doing different things, different circumstances. That's the point. We haven't seen it while work looking at really engaging, uh, quite provocative, mm -hmm. and very much from the activist perspective, certainly from the shadow space perspective, just what you expect. That's a very So it's big business corporations and film loves it. It's easy to do the small guy versus the big guy. So in one scene in the pipe, you have the little boat going out and the big uh, solitaire, big shell to see, uh, big ship, massive ship. So even in showing those, juxtaposing those two images, you get the message. Inside of um, So the functions as an observational documentary, uh, very similar, I would say, in some ways to the environment I, I constructed documentary cloud. So it's reifying a romantic vision of nature and seascape, which humans would become the cause. Uh, 
So that's a really good new paper that apparently came out from Iowa. Iowa is a very good journal on literature and film. So how do we, some of you will have heard of John Bambi Foster. So how do we help to defend nature? Do we just use nature capital as a game? Once we monetize nature, then you're in danger of playing the same game as the capitalist system. And, and that sort of, but yeah, that's been a solution. Some say we have to monetize, we have to give it a value, we have to give nature capital and what nature is giving to us a value, whether it's landscape, whether it's forests, we have to put that, that's the only thing in the economic model we live in, uh, understand. Uh, so the new business, in her, this is a, it's an incredible, it's free, it's free, so we don't have the bees pollinated, we don't have the land, so we all know that nature sort of doesn't charge, which is giving us you know, sort of ways of creating food and whatever. And from that paradigm shift of looking at things in that sort of is still not acceptable in, within large uh, sort of parts of, of, of stakeholders. Most people don't buy into that. And yet it's, it's obvious that it doesn't make sense. Um, so putting a monetary value on what nature does for Business. Um, we all know about the lungs of the earth in the in the in the, in the forests and in, in the sort of all sort of the, wherever it is across uh, across the, the earth that's being denuded, where we're losing 80, 90 percent of our biodiversity loss. It's having huge implications. So again, that washes over. People don't really connect with that. And yet that's so shocking. And yet, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of David Bellamy. Uh, I think some of his more recent documentaries have been stunning in him coming out at last. Um, the uh, not Bellamy, I'm talking about Attenborough. Bellamy, it's Bellamy still around. Attenborough is just, it's, if you haven't seen the Netflix on our series, that it's really, really fascinating. It works on that, and even though Birds of this world can be seen as the white messiah savior, mm. and that's really problematic. So we need new sort of uh, activists and new voices, new ways of telling that story. Most of you have heard George Mommio, and you know, again, he's quite a well-known um, journalist in Ireland. So the natural capital agenda is price evaluation, monetizing, financialization of nature. It's the same in the name of saving it. So it's a big hypocrite on our part, but that's what's resonant in some form. There's another good documentary, I haven't seen it. It's for kids. I saw it in the IFI in Dublin with a group of transition year students that need to be mobilized into this issue of the earth. So it's, a, it's an Australian director that's making a film for his daughter and trying to play with intergenerational justice about how to connect what could be. So he's very positive. He's coming up with solutions rather than just seeing the problems. And that's often argued is what needs to be mobilized to direct and connect with non-environmental audiences. They need solutions on this basis, not just telling them the problem. They know the problem, they think they know the problem. So again, it's very high production values. Uh, it is quite good. Some of it could be a bit over the top of this one. So uh, these are some other films that I've used in my late book. Uh, some of you might have seen John. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, well, I'll need to stop. So again, if you want to talk about any of them, do so. I'm, I'm going to keep going because uh, there are some of the films that I've analysed and they're great films. Okay, so. We talked earlier about this UNESCO environmental sustainability. We, you know, it's, it's this glib. It's like the, the, the sort of everyone comes up with lots of different areas. Does that work? Does that connect? Uh, again, composition. Another great documentary is a documentary called Earth. It's by an Austrian filmmaker. And again, it's all about talking to the workers in these big exploitation industries from absolutely raping the planet. And yet these are fantastic interviews. 
because they're both aware of their environmental agenda, but they're also sort of able to it and able to see. So it is not saying for philosophy. It's quite a it's not an easy viewing, it's more our task. So he, he goes to these are the places he goes to and reimagine and sort of talks them in the interest life with teacher text. We keep arguing about a teacher text. Again, this is a term that we use in media studies about David Buckingham talked about soap operas. Soap operas are teacher texts that teach. Lots of people have to have relationships, have to deal with conflict. We need ways of explaining things to people. People aren't reading the novels anymore. Read Wuthering Heights, you'll read them, you'll find out a lot about the novel in Wuthering Heights. But if you don't read novels, you don't read stuff. So media is very important for socialising. And in the same way, it can be used for obviously environmental. So the audience angle is something that I just get on to. How audiences respond? We need audiences to respond, and we keep having this tension in environmental communication that it's scientific, therefore it's rationality we need to engage with. Whereas we would argue it's emotion, it's connecting to the heart, is as important, if not more important, to resonate with. Audiences need an effort. So, and I have scientists, friends who say, God, they're emotional. It's a bit risky, isn't it? But humans are emotional beings and they need to connect on an emotion. So, communicating environmental issues with emotion. So, we talked about a bit about this, this sort of danger of greenwashing. And I want to just get on education and it's really important. I want to keep getting on to this. The second part of the talk, and I'll do a very quick four minutes quickly. This, this is me involved in this company, a company we set up, Screen Reading, and it's trying to build a coalition of media producers and funders to try and sort of get this carbon calculator and try and make it as part of the, of the main agenda, rather than just seeing it as, oh yeah, everyone does their own thing. So we, we sort of, as I said, we bought the, we leased out the carbon calculator every year and we get out the paper, and that was the bottom. So it's set up as using this carbon calendar. It's now quite mainstreamed. We have a lot of RTs, every program that they're doing, they say it's going to teach the car style. They're making their studios more efficient by the big problem in outside productions is this Jenny, the, the, the diesel Jenny. A lot of outside productions use a really dirty diesel Jenny, and all they need to do is an electric. Are a more sophisticated thing that costs a bit more, but be much lower in the And they're starting to do that. So, trying to get new production methods, best practice around sustainable production. And that's what it's all about. Um, and getting public support in it. We're having a meeting in January, February with the minister to try and move it into a more, more uh, to, to sort of have it as part of the government policy. Uh, down south, the BAI is being abolished, and we have a new screen center, and they're going to take it over. And just respond. So, how to sort of get best practice, how to link with climate change and engage with sort of big rich champions across the industry. Um, promoting sustainability, which John knows all about and writes a lot about, it, but we need to sort of see sustainability, not just this bland term which everyone uses and abuses, but linking it to environmental sustainability gives it some sort of anchorage and makes it more relevant and resonant. So we're looking at different projects which we'd like to do. So we, we put in funding for a new bid, which we get a, a broad new bid, looking at trying to see how sustainability or greening media production could add a competitive edge as a vehicle. And the report and the sponsors can't prove that. So it is. Which is a bit. But anyway, so you know, can greening stuff be good? But as you say, you're playing into the, the economy, but we're trying to get all media production companies to become more sustainable. Uh, these are the sort of links we have with. My colleague uh, David Lund, uh, Anthony Muldoon in Screen Producers Ireland, and my good friend John Gormley helped set up this. He's an ex minister for, for the environment. So he's now working in the film. So, trying to get best practice across Europe, 
learning from Britain. Britain is quite advanced in some of its strategies and how to promote radical change. Then we talked a bit about this. So, I'm so nudging and tipping points. Transformation. There are some of my books. So I, as I say, Hollywood Utopia, I started with my PhD, and then I've been working around this for the last 20 years. Some of the books, if you're interested, in, there's a big debate in new media studies about the, the turn towards materials. So they're looking at the material cost of media, and that includes new media and the whole big debate we're having about data centers. At the moment, and how computer in sort of there's no such thing as green media. There's no such thing as, a, as an easy that the old media was all dirty and whatever, and that new media is all sophisticated, and that's it's proven to. So these are some writers who have done work on that and um, really good stuff. And an example of a good practice would be this is a book that's just come out that I have a chapter in with my colleagues. The idea of, of it's almost like looking at if some of you remember poor cinema or going back to, can we reimagine the fetishization of technology and media try to go back to a different strategy and actually glorify and celebrate small, small scale? No, so this Laura Marx has done this thing of trying to sort of produce a sort of a film festival where all the problems have to be on a small scale, have to be using not 4G. But other forms, not just endlessly trying to increase the power of their digital footprint, but trying to reduce it. So I, I think it's an interesting concept, if it has legs. Uh, I only find out about in the last few weeks. So I put there some of my I say books. Sorry for going on so much. Thank you very much. Uh,